You're listening to the Late Night Football Show with your host, Rohit Singh. That's me. On this show, we talk about some of the most serious, least silly topics from the world of football for your entertainment and enjoyment. Please remember that the show is BYOL. Bring your own laughs, since we don't have the budget for a studio audience. Happy listening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Late Night Football. We were supposed to do this episode last week, but there were other more important matters to discuss. But better late than never, I suppose. So let's get into it. It's been a year since the 2019 Women's World Cup was held in France. The tournament was actually a huge, unprecedented success with higher attendance numbers than ever before and much more coverage on TV and in the media. FIFA has already jumped on the bandwagon by expanding the next World Cup to 32 teams from 24 the last time around. But after a year, I wanted to take a look back, not just at the tournament itself, but also how, if at all, has it impacted the women's game in general. However, I'm sure some of you are bored just listening to me talk about this. So I decided that we needed a special guest for this show and this topic. After doing a lot of searching and thinking, for about 10 minutes, I found the perfect guest to join this show. She is a former Toronto Rec League star, former winner of her office World Cup bracket tournament, person who partied like it's 2004 when Greece won the Euros in 2004 and played for the East York Eagles for six years. So she's practically a legend over there. Ladies and gentlemen, listeners of this podcast, please join me in welcoming former Torontonian, now residing all the way out in Lake Country, British Columbia, Canada, Maria Mazina. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much, Rohit. Thank you for having me. This is my first time on a podcast and I'm super excited. Oh, no, no. The pleasure is all mine. I wanted to let you know that you're the first woman on this show, as well as the first Canadian guest that I've had on the show. That must be a really big honor for you, right? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Now, this topic is very important and I wanted to have an expert voice on this to give their opinion. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anyone. So I have to make do with you for this one. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> oh, I missed our banter, Rohit. Oh, well, so before we begin, I do have two warm-up questions for you. Uh, first, since you're not American, do you prefer soccer or football? Oh, like, in, like the word? Yes. Um, I, mean, I know. I say... I'm joking. It's all right. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> Well, like, um, I, I like both. I, I, I don't mind either, you know. Yeah, like my, uh, my... It's, yeah, actually, you don't get to decide. We're just sticking with football. <laughs> I was just joking. It didn't matter what you would have said to me. Well, anyway. my dad's from England. Like, I honestly don't mind football. I, I almost prefer it. I, let's say football. We are going to stick with that. Yes. Okay. It's, it's soccer. But anyway, it. uh, it's my show, right? So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, but moving on, I heard from one of my colleagues that women's football is actually rougher than men's football. Apparently, there's a lot of biting, a lot of hair pulling that goes on in, in those games. Oh, yeah, for sure. Is, is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there, it was, there was a lot of um, that kind of behavior when I played rep soccer. Um, yeah, it can get pretty nasty. And, it's, and the parents, too. The parents can be worse than the players themselves, actually. Really? Why yeah. Um, they just taunt you. They try and get inside your head or they'll show up drunk. Like, it's just like, it's pretty ridiculous. Wow. Rohit, did you know that I've gotten a red card before? No, I did not, actually. No. Oh, really? Yeah. Why, yeah. why did you get a red card? <laughs> I, I kind of blacked it out of my memory, but someone reminded me of it recently. And it was kind of like a... Remember um, Zinedine Zidane? Yeah, Zidane, yes. <laughs> Zidane, is that how you pronounce it? Zidane? Zidane, yes. Zidane. He pronounces Zidane, yes. Zidane. So Zidane, um, he was kind of like riled up by the other player. So I think that's what happened. I was, I was just getting riled up by this other player. She kept like fouling me, but not, not getting carded for it. And then I think out of nowhere, I just like pushed her and everyone like was just so shocked because I was just like this little shy girl that like our my coaches were always telling me to like get stronger and get more like (laughs) vicious and so I finally did and they're like oh oh okay (laughs) and they brought me off the field but yeah I've gotten a red card before were you suspended for a few games or was it just like one of those red cards that nobody cares about uh I 
I think it was just the one game. Uh, so. Cool. Well, mm -hmm. well, that is great to know. Um, was it? Did did the person who got pushed? Did they make the most of it, or was it like an actual like push? Like you actually? It was like a full on push. So like you deserve it, that. Right? It wasn't discreet at all. Like I, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was. It was not the right way to do it. But you know, I rather be direct. I guess. <laughs> yeah, and thankfully now we are doing this on video calls, so you know, I, I'm safe for now. All right. Well, I eventually did find rugby. I guess that was my like <laughs> proper place. <laughs> All right. Well. All right. So we've got the pleasantries out of the way. It's now time for the serious stuff. <laughs> so a year ago, you and I watched many of the games on TV during the World Cup, and from my perspective, it was a very interesting experience. I'm not a big fan of international football in general. But I had never really sat down to watch women's international games before. Having done so last year, it was a really eye-opening experience because the level of play was really good at times. There was definitely a lot more action compared to men's tournaments. But most importantly, it feels like that tournament has given it a platform to take that next big leap in its growth and evolution. Now I have noticed that there has been an increase in media coverage about the women's game over the past year, which is great. But that has also been met with similar comments from some people about how it's pointless or that nobody actually cares. However, that's just my admittedly limited experience. Do you think that the women's game has changed public and media perception since that tournament? Do you think there's more awareness about the game now? Yeah, like as you said in the intro, viewership is definitely increasing. Um, I read that. Uh, 1.12 billion viewers um, there were for the women's tournament last year, um, but it's obviously not as big as uh, for the men's, which was 3.5 billion, um, which is like half the world's population. Um, but so there are still barriers in place. For example, last year's final was scheduled on the same day as the Copa America and Gold Cup finals, and I don't think they would have done that for the men's league. And in terms of general perception, I think it's improving, but there's definitely room to grow. For example, last year I asked a male friend if he was watching the World Cup and he temporarily got excited until he realized I was talking about the Women's World Cup. And so one thing that I would love to see changed is instead of having FIFA World Cup and FIFA Women's World Cup, FIFA Men's World Cup and FIFA Women's World Cup, right? Like why should women's soccer be this like sub-tournament of the men's? Um, yeah, so I think about that. I, I also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, like, if we talk about gender equality and didn't talk about, like, tra transgender and non-binary folks as well. I think we need to create spaces in sport for, uh, for everyone. And, um, and I've done some, like, brief research on this topic, but I'd like to dig in more, but... Yeah, if we're talking about men and women soccer, um, we, we need to talk about uh, transgender and bi non-binary folks as well. Okay, so it seems like we already have our first controversial statement of the episode. <laughs> I can already imagine people rolling their eyes or angrily typing away in the comments section about what you just said. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, you are correct though. And that is an observation I had as well about the naming of events, you know, between men's World Cup or World Cup and women's World Cup. However, it is starting to change a little bit, I've noticed from what I've seen and read, but there's still a very long way to go. And I'm not sure how ready people are, or even how ready FIFA is. You were talking about representation for transgender and binary folks, but I don't even think FIFA has thought that far ahead. Uh, everyone who has seen my previous episodes knows that I'm very cynical about the organization, so I doubt that anything will change in that regard anytime soon. For now, hopefully, they will continue to work on women's football, though, as much as they have been doing, because I don't necessarily trust them to, but it is really important. I did see um, the Football Association has a policy on trans people in football. That, that was something. I don't know. That, that was just on my brief research of it. But, um, yeah, definitely a far way to go. Um, let's keep going. <laughs> okay, um, off to a very good start here. Yeah, I think we've already created a bit of controversy, so... <laughs> <laughs> we got to speak to the issues, Rohit. Maybe you're going to get more listeners because... Hopefully, that's, that's the hope. Um, 
Okay, so let's make a decision to call it World Cup from this point on. No more Women's World Cup. We'll just call it the World Cup. And we can't talk about the tournament without talking about that promo video from the German team. Now, I know you've watched it, Maria, but for all of you listening to this show, if you haven't seen it, you definitely should. I will post a link in the description if I can find it for you. It was just so well thought out and executed. Uh, Maria, what was your impression when you were watching it? Oh, yeah, definitely watch it if you haven't. I loved it. Um, just even the quote, like, we play for a nation that doesn't even know our names, like, and they've won eight titles for their country. Um, and they talk about important issues. They talk about the discrepancy between how they are treated versus the male team. For example, their fir- for their first title, they won a tea set. Oh, great, a tea set. Um, and they talk about the discrimination they face from viewers as well, like criticizing them um, simply because they are women playing sports. Um, you know, I have a friend who I used to play soccer with on the Easter Eagles. Um, she now does shot put and has, has competed in Canada, um, competed for Canada in the Olympics, among other world-renowned um, tournaments, and recently opened up on social media about how equality between men and women in sports is far from being achieved. She talked about the feeling of, of pressure to like wear makeup during tournaments so that she can be perceived as a woman. And she ultimately said she will not conform to these beauty standards and that being strong is beautiful in itself. So I think she's an amazing role model. I think this video is, is wonderful and touches on a lot of these issues um, that are really important uh, to women's sports. Yeah, I liked it because it brought to light so many important issues about the game, particularly around the lack of recognition and the patronizing culture that exists for women from men that uh, are administrators in the game. But it didn't do so in such a preachy way. Rather, it was a tongue-in-cheek criticism. I mean, it really shows how different the field is for women versus men, even though we play the same game. Uh, There are some harsh truths in there, And I think we don't like to speak about it, but they're very important to address. And this video did a really great job highlighting them. And what was great was they used it as something to be proud of, that they have overcome all these barriers, as opposed to looking for sympathy or pity, which I think resonated much better. I mean, they came out looking like badasses. (laughs) But this tournament was also used by many players to bring LGBTQ issues to light, particularly by those who were LGBTQ folks themselves, Uh, They talked about the challenges that they faced in their communities and in football because the game hasn't always had a great track record when it comes to these things, for women or men. And as someone who I know is invested in the challenges faced by the LGBT community, what did you make of that? Yeah, I I think it's amazing. Honestly, like, I I love when people who have a big platform use their voice, um, on political issues. Um, I, I don't like when people are criticized for, you know, telling them to like stick to sports, like just play the game. Like, no, like politics is personal and it affects every corner of our lives. And if that's going to um, help bring some more people into the game, it's going to help um, there to be more inclusion. Yes, like, yes, 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 stand up for this. Um, I love it. So, you may have heard that there is a pandemic going on right now. Yeah. What? <laughs> um, what? <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. And football, like many other things, was forced to shut down for the last three months. But now, in Europe, football is slowly returning in many of the countries like Spain, Germany, England, Italy. However, that's only men's football. In most of the countries, the top women's football leagues have been cancelled for the season mostly because attendance revenues are important for the clubs and until fans can be allowed in for games, it wouldn't make financial sense to play. This, by the way, is a situation that is also faced in the men's game, but at Division 3 levels or regional levels. The top men's leagues are all going ahead because they rely more on TV revenue and they'll get that even with closed door matches. What do you think about this situation, that the top women's leagues have financial situations that are comparable to lower league or regional league football in the men's game. I mean, is that poor management from those that won it? Yeah, so I read a recent article actually um, that the top German women's league is actually returning. And um, the article said that was thanks to $2 million from the men's league 
to help fund with like testing and like other COVID related costs because apparently those are um, pretty high. So I think that demonstrates some equality leadership. Um, <clears throat> in terms of England and Spain, I also heard Italy might be um, coming back with soccer. I, I did read that France has canceled, I believe, both men and women's soccer. Correct me if yes. I'm wrong. France, France, England will have the men's back, the women's is canceled. Right, I'm right. Sure, the states is somewhere along that line as well. All those states seasons are different. It's more mm. March to, De- to December, November, so it's a little bit different. But yeah, yeah, like the fact that it's mainly a financial decision, it's unfortunate because I, I think it shows where the league priorities lie. However, um, I'm sure there's like a range of different opinions from all different players and. And coaches, I'm sure some are furious. I'm sure maybe some are even relieved. Like I have no idea. Um, but as far as you know, the teams playing, I hope they have the resources to be able to play safely and help um, and stay healthy. And I hope those teams not playing can still train um, safely and come back hopefully next year strong. Well, it was a financial decision, unfortunately. I mean, I'm sure that the players and coaches would love to return if the conditions were safe and players were regularly tested, but they weren't given that option because of where the game is money-wise. Uh, it's also sad because many of the women's teams also have men's teams, which play in the top leagues in Europe with multi-million dollar budgets, while at the same time allocating less than a tenth of that for their women's teams. I mean, it really shows how far we need to go and where people's priorities lies, even though they may make statements to the contrary about equality and things like that. So it's really it's really sad to see that. Now, anyway, speaking of priorities, let's talk about our favorite topic, diversity and inclusion. Uh, now, I said this in my last episode that football has a big problem with diversity and inclusion. And I'm not here suggesting that men should only manage men's teams or women should only manage women's teams. But after doing a quick Wikipedia research, I found some really startling information. In the US, which by the way, for those of you who don't know, is the gold standard when it comes to women's football, internationally at least, their top women's league only has one woman manager out of nine teams. One. In England's Women's Super League, which is their top league, it's a bit better with seven out of twelve managers being women, but only one of those is a woman of colour. I'm sure both of us can see something wrong here, and hopefully a lot of listeners as well. So how can we increase representation for women in the game, particularly those of color? Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't think I was surprised. Um, it, it's sexism, it's, you know, it's, it's systemic racism. Like, yeah, no, not surprised. And I would say, you know, the solution to that is hiring them. Hire, you know, seek out women, seek out women of color, like seek them out like you would seek out old white men, you know, like, (laughs) and, um, you know, we also need to talk about diversity of players as well, like Canada, the US, England, other European countries, I think they can definitely do a lot more to increase the diversity of their teams and removing those barriers due to systemic racism. Um, Yeah. As you know, diversity drives success, right, Rohit? Please note that I have not made that statement. (laughs) Do you think so? (laughs) In case anyone's looking to sue for copyright protection, please direct that to Maria, not me. (laughs) But but do you believe that players have it difficult, though? I've always felt that since football is talent-based at a playing level, if you are highly talented, it would be difficult to deny you from playing unless the coach was really racist, no? Um, In terms of players... I think like where this, the analogy of, or us talking about talent, the issue with that is, you know, due to barriers put up by systemic racism, maybe um, a disproportionate amount of um, black players or um, other uh, people of color wouldn't even get to that tryout. because of those issues, right? Because of lack of funding, because of whatever, like scholarships or just not being pushed to that opportunity. Wow, I hadn't thought of that actually. That's a very good point. I think that shows that all of us need a better understanding of issues that are faced by people of color, especially women of color, because that would then lead us to creating better systems in place to look to allow everyone to find a pathway and achieve their fullest potential. That is incredible insight. Thanks so much, Maria. Yeah, 
that's okay. Important so, stuff to talk about. Yeah. My final question for you today is who is your favorite player of all time and why is it Christine Sinclair? Oh my god, I was going to say I know, <laughs> you're Canadian, you're not allowed to have another no, answer. No, 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 that's not even my answer. I was going to ask you what what do you think I'm going to say? Um, so no, that's not my answer. What? My answer is Martha, obviously Rohit. Wait, there's nothing See, obvious about it. Uh, okay, well I'll tell you why then. So she's yeah. an amazing. Martha is an amazing player. She was so passionate. She holds the record for the most career World Cup goals for men and women, seventeen goals. And um, I love that she talked about that record as being important to her, but for like women and for uh, the women's game in general. And I was really moved by her speech. Do you remember her speech last year? And um, it was after the um, Brazil lost to France. And it was just very passionate. And she just wants to lift other women up by encouraging them to work hard and take care of themselves. Uh, yeah, I just love everything she's about. I love her red lipstick, like symbolizing the blood she's leaving on the field. Like, oh, I love it. She's just amazing. Okay. So I give you an opportunity to gain some Canadian brownie points here, but you've <laughs> clearly squandered it. She's amazing. I just... Yes, she is amazing. And you should have picked her. That moment's gone now. Where are my Martha fr- fans at? Listeners, smash a like on this episode if you also love Marta, like Maria here. I mean, I think this is a perfect time to make a plug. There's another first we've accomplished in this episode. I've never said that before. So that's really great. Oh, well. I think it's best to end it here now before you or I get in any more trouble than we already have. Uh, Thank you so much, Maria, for joining me on this episode. I hope you had fun. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, It's been great chatting with you. Uh, Tell me something I don't know. Anyway, before you go, I understand you have a special message for our listeners today. Yes, this is the first podcast I've ever been on and the best. Please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. If you want me back for another episode, please smash the like. Well, there you go, guys. You heard it from Maria herself. So please do as she says or she will be very upset. And you've already heard what she does when she gets upset. So please don't make her upset. Take care, guys, and see you again next week.